What if I told you you can keep your property empty and still make huge amounts of money? What is capital growth and how does it work? So what is capital growth? Well, capital growth or a capital appreciation is the value of the property and how much it actually increases on a year to year basis. For example, if a property is worth 100,000 today and it increases by 5% in a year, then next year it would be worth 105,000. And that 5,000 pounds or the 5% increase is the capital appreciation or capital gain or capital growth growth of the property. So what actually impacts that? And let's see a worked example. One of the quantities that really impact capital growth is the demand for property in the first place. And it's not actually the strongest one, by the way. But if we look at demand, because it's basic economics, the more demand there is for something, the higher the price is going to go. But number one is population density. And population density is how many people are actually looking for a property in the first place. Another thing that increases it is jobs. If there are an increase in jobs in the area, for example, a new company, let's think about Leeds, for example, Channel 4 is moving their headquarters here, moving thousands of jobs, thousands of opportunities into Leeds. Naturally, that's going to increase population density, therefore increasing the price of property. The next thing is logistics. And what I mean by logistics is also amenities or amenities. <laughs> There you go. Logistics and amenities. So transport links. Are there shopping centers, ice rinks, cinemas, and everything else that makes it a great area for people to live in? If there's more emotional reasons for people to live there, like the enjoyment factor of, in, of living in a location, that's also going to drive the demand or how many people want to live there, therefore increasing the competition per property, and that creates a bidding war situation which drive property prices up. Next is schools. And I know this could be included into a logistics session as well, but good schools, so either good or outstanding schools, which you can search on the Ofsted ratings, that really drives a herd mentality. If you think about the long-term stayers in a location, it's young families. So but in buy to lets, it's making somebody else's house their home, or indeed to live there. But ultimately, once a kid's in school, say they're in year three, which is what, seven years old, Old, they're at least going to stay in the same place until year six, until they go to senior school, which is what, four years. And so because there's that pent up demand again and again and again, and people don't just suddenly sell and leave, it's going to put pressure on the supply levels, again, further increasing the value of property in an area. Finally, investment. And what I'm really looking at is the investment by local councils and authorities in the area. If I give an example right now, in and around Doncaster, there's billions being invested right now into industrial sites, offices, ice rinks, shopping center, all of that sort of thing. And so a relatively okay area is suddenly getting a flood of jobs, a flood of in logistics and amenities, increasing population density and another school going into place, increasing the demand for the area and driving up the prices. The biggest factor of increasing prices is actually supply. There's only two really big factors into the supply of property. Number one is the availability of money. And I'm not just talking about how much excess capital that people have, i.e. for their deposit, their stamp duty, their legals, maybe a bit of a refurbishment, but also the mortgage availability and the criteria around that. So for example, if interest rates are a little higher, it's going to restrict people's lending ability. The multiplier, you know, do you need four times the salary or eight times the salary? But once there's a limitation of capital or finance available, that shrinks the availability of supply of funding, which then impacts the demand or the purchasing power of property. 
The biggest one of all is, in fact, not investors, not people buying properties living, not people upsizing, downsizing, is actually the supply or availability of property in the first place. So mainly due to the UK's really restrictive planning portals and planning issues, it is archaic, like it is so old school. The government, government makes it so difficult for people to develop and build their own property or build 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 properties. And because of this lack of supply, there is a massive housing shortage. At the time of filming this, there's over a 1 million unit housing shortage. That means there is 1 million homes that are needed that are no longer there. And by the time you've watched this, it could be 1.1, 1.2 or even more. But what I can near guarantee is this problem has not been solved. And it very unlikely will do in my lifetime. But if the government is going to end up maintaining the situation with property, they have to sort something out with the planning issues in property right now. So let's jump into a worked example. Let's say we've got this worked example here and we're gonna call it a £200,000 property because why not? So we've got a 200,000 pound property and it's worth 200,000 today. Now the rent on this, actually let's work out the capital it's gonna go in. So first of all, you're gonna get a 25% equity investment in there. Almost every buy to let investment you need to put in 25% on. So 25% of the 200,000 is 50,000. Then you've got your stamp duty on that, which for ease I'm gonna call 3%. So that's 6,000 pounds is actually a little bit more than that. And then let's say there's the refurb and fees, whatever it is, at £10,000. Now, these are just example numbers. They're not to be used seriously. That means the cash going into this property is £66,000. So not a bad amount of money, a decent chunk of cash going in. And of course, in buy to let you make your money through cash flow. Or do you? So let's go into this and let's say we are getting £400 per calendar month for this property. I'm not talking the gross amount, the rent might be £1,000, but after paying the mortgage, your maintenance, the management, the insurance, the voids, whatever it is, let's say you are netting before tax £400 per calendar month. If you times that by 12, 12 months in a year, that's going to give you £4,800. And then what we're going to do is look at the return on capital employed. Return on capital employed is going to be the 4,800, this figure here, divided by the 66,000, which is this figure here. You are dividing the 4,800 per year net income divided by the 66,000 pound in cash that you've put into the property, which is equal to 7.27% a nice healthy return, right? But actually it gets a lot better. Now, one thing with capital growth is you can't guarantee it. There are no guarantees in investment and in the short term, property values can go up and down, okay? You could actually lose money on property value. Over the long term, property typically doubles every 10 years or so. So on average, the one year capital growth is 7.9% and that's been for almost a thousand years now. But let's call it 5% capital growth. I'll put CG there and we're gonna do 5% and it's not of the cash that's gone in, it's on the property value. Remember we said it's a £200,000 value, 5% on that is £10,000. And then again, what we're going to do is £10,000 divided by the cash in, which is £66,000, and that's gonna give a value of 15.15%. How insane is that? So if we added those two together, we're gonna have 22.42%. But the main thing that I'm getting at is, whilst capital growth isn't guaranteed, a majority of people actually make their wealth through capital growth in property, and they create financial freedom through the cash flow. And it's a really powerful thing to actually understand, and you should test this out yourself. Go online right now, jump onto Rightmove, and type in a random postcode. Okay, let's say LS12-1PG. I know in LS12, an average property is gonna be 125,000. I know that the average 
average growth in that area is about six and a half and that's being conservative and what you should do is jump on to today's video sponsor Lendlord it's completely free click the link below and fill in your details go on the analyzer and follow this along it's the only software out there right now that is free that also factors the capital growth into your property investment so fill in the postcode bring in the property details and on the right hand side you can put in what your predicted capital growth is as I said I recommend 5% because I think that is a very conservative long-term capital growth figure and what you're going to see over a 10 15 20 year period is that whilst the cash flow is great and creates a position of financial freedom it's capital growth that is really going to increase your wealth and for a lot of you investing in property is what is going to make you into a millionaire. Now remember what I said, capital growth is not guaranteed. It will not go up every single year, but for the last thousand years, it's doubled every 10 years. It goes up 7.9% on an annual basis, ups and downs, of course, conservatively 5%. And if you value your proper property investments, take an account of both the cash flow and the capital growth, you will find out what a safe, secure, and substantial investment the property is. So click the link below. Thank you to Lendlord for sponsoring this video. If you're new to the channel, make sure to hit the subscribe and the notification bell. And if you got value from this, make sure to destroy the like button on the way to the next video.